Two years ago, we, I think it was two years ago, we did another city council debate at Shine. We've done a ton with New Era. Steve Fenberg is coming in a bit um, over the years. And um, they've been huge and a ton of work and exhausting. And I'm 41 years old now. So I just want to do a little small, a little small form. A little, yeah. <laughs> it's not that bad. Is that old? Um, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. So um, I wanted to do a little small forum uh, and video it and share it. So if every, anyone likes tonight, we're going to try and do three things. Keep it civil. Oh. <laughs> Cindy, out. Oh. <laughs> we're going to try and keep it civil. There hasn't been a lot of civility lately in Boulder about important issues to all of us. And we're all united in wanting a... Um, I can't say livable boulder anymore, but, uh, <laughs> but a boulder we want to live in. I can't say a better boulder or, or a more open boulder. Um, um, right. Elephant Tonight is announcing the forming of our new 501c3 weirder boulder. Um, so, uh, number one, civility. So, anyone. There's one exception to that, that's me. If anyone's not civil, you'll be cut off at the knees. Um, number two, fun. Imagine. A lot of silence, a lot of intimidation. How do we be fun? Um, and number three, short. Mercifully short. So we're gonna try, so here's how it's gonna work. We have no idea, number one. Number two, it'll be, um, I think we're going for an hour, Mariah. Mariah has done all the work to make this happen. Yeah. While me and my staff have been up in Estes Park doing yoga. yoga. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look at that bugling elk. How lovely. Oh, Mariah's bugging me again about this forum. Um, so um, we've invited VIP uh, question askers, that's the technical term, VIP community leaders to, um, and they don't have to be important to uh, pretentious people, they just have to be important to the community. So they'll be asking questions that'll range from affordable housing to housing, um, to what have you. Um, and, uh, and then we'll do a, another civil 300-301 uh, discussion, and I'll play a kind of ignorant, befuddled idiot, which is going to be quite a stretch, as Bob Morehouse would tell you. Um, and, uh, and then, what else? Is that it? And then we're going to we're gonna get together. The we're all going to go back, drink some IPA um, or lager or whatever, and in, then make our endorsements. And going back, the jury will only spend two or three minutes because they don't actually get a vote. It's just all me. <laughs> so I think, is that, is there anything else? Yeah, you so need we, the, um, the fabulous brewery that's donated the beer. Well, we actually were just getting the donation for the elephant staff. We didn't oh. need to share it. Um, no, I'm, I'm teasing. So it's, so it's, um, it's uh, Simon and Garfunkel, a wonderful lo local brewery. Uh, Finkel and Garf, thank you so much. You're, you're the best brewery in town, except for maybe Mountain Sun. And Well, New Belgium is not in town, but I love them. And uh, Avery and Ash and Upslope, Asher. And I'm what sensing else? a trend here. What's that? Yes. I'm sensing a trend here. Yeah. 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 So, um, anything else? Sorry, I forgot my notes. Oh, I wanted to thank our sponsors. Um, the local Walmart. Tebow. And, and Brad Feld. Thank you. Um, anything else? Could I make one ask? Uh, no. Let's, sorry. We're just going to keep this fast. Okay. What else? Anything else? Let's do it. Let's do it. So we're starting with a question, and we can start with you, since you're ready to talk. No, no. We're starting with the first question, remember? God, Mariah. Let me do it. Let's do it. So the first question is, you have a choice, I guess. And we'll start at this end. What's your favorite place or institution in Boulder? This is an easy one, and this is in lieu of your talking about yourself for five minutes, um, this is how we're going to get to know you. So try and say something about your values. What's your favorite place or institution in Boulder? Or you have a second um, option, which is what would you like to, how would you like to see Boulder uh, be an example to other cities and towns 
in the US, particularly over the next 10 years. And please introduce yourself. And wait, they all have to be on this mic, right? Everyone has to be on the mic or it won't be recorded. Yeah, exactly. And you have no voice. Okay, so I'm Comrade Keith Percy, candidate for city council. And I guess since I have the option, I'm going to take the easy question. And I think at present, my, my favorite places in Boulder are the North Boulder Park and the Deschambe Tea House, where I can't always afford to eat, but where it's always lovely to sit and see what's growing and meditate. So with that, I'll keep it fast and pass it on. All right, keeping Thank it you. short. Uh, hi, I'm Aaron Brockett, um, and I have to go for my favorite place. I talk about this all the time, uh, people who know me. It's the Holiday Neighborhood, uh, where I live. Um, I've been there for 11 years, since one of the first families in there, and I live in a townhouse there with my wife and two kids in uh, Wild Sage Co-Housing. And uh, I have my office across the street from my house, so I'm a software developer. I have a small firm, my wife and I co-own it, and we can walk across the street uh, to work every day and then walk down the street to our favorite coffee shop and get a beer or dinner down the street at Proto's and take our dog to doggy daycare down the street at the, anyway. So walkable neighborhood, love it, it's a beautiful place. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jan Burton. My favorite place is a particular wall, which I'm not going to name, that is part of Open Space Mountain Parks and I'm a Falcon Monitor. So I get to go up there um, in the six months when we watch and observe the Falcons. Hi, I'm Cha Cha Spinrad. My favorite place in Boulder is a co-op that invites friends into their community and um, it's just a really warm and welcoming space and they have community meals that they invite people to. Thank you. I'm Leonard May, and I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> That's Leonard. All right, Zan? No, I'm, te I'm teasing. <laughs> Leonard, so your favorite place or institution in Boulder? Or how you would like to see Boulder oh, okay. known in the next 10 right. years? Right. Well, what I'd like to see Boulder known 10 years from now is actually having made some real solid progress for, res for uh, resolving, I think, two of our major issues. One is our affordable housing issue, and the other one is that we are a municipally owned utility and have very low community carbon emissions. Thank you, that's a timely reminder. So if any of the council candidates agree with something, instead of making noise or clapping or whatever, which you can do, um, you can raise the elephant sticker to signal yes. If no, you can look grumpy and not do it, <laughs> n not raise anything. I was going to say what Leonard just said. I would like to see us leading the country in terms of having a municipal electric utility and showcasing all the amazing ways a community can be living a zero carbon or close to it um, future. So that's what I envision for us. So for me, my favorite place is all the community. Oh. I'm Lisa Morzell. See me at lisamorzell.com. And anyway. real quick, real quick, I think we forgot your, you didn't say your name, Sorry. Suzanne Jones. Suzanne Jones. Thank you. Zan. Zan. Lisa Morzell here. So my favorite place are, is yes. the um, library and all the various com uh, community branches. I like it because it's a level playing field for everybody in the community, regardless of economic status. I like it because it offers opportunities for everybody. It offers job potential, education potential, and it's the future. And I like it for what it creates in terms of potential for our residents. And I want to see Boulder embracing all those things about libraries in our future. Thank you. Ed Jabari, um, edjabari.com. Um, <laughs> my favorite <laughs> and place. And I sell used cars. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. <Thank> you. <laughs> my favorite place is the place I live and I'm developing called The Secret Garden in North Boulder on Broadway Street and it's, it, we're aiming to have a community cultural plaza which uh, encompasses a lot of, uh, you know, the goals that are in the comprehensive plan that seem to not be um, put forward, uh, you know, in the same, uh, at the same level as, as brick and mortar development or, you know, concrete and steel. Um, so we, we do permaculture and uh, community gatherings, art and, art and culture, we sell neonic free and organic plants, nice. and invite you all to come out. 
I'm Jyotsna Raj, and uh, Lisa stole my favorite place to be an institution, which is a library. I volunteered there for many, many years, and I now run a, a program through the library, a book group called The Great Indian Novel. And we read really cool books. We're meeting on Thursday, and I will be there. But since he has stolen this, I will say that my favorite place to be is my own neighborhood, where we helped establish a small historic neighborhood called University Place. I was very instrumental in that, and it brought me in touch with all my neighbors. I went door to door explaining to them the values of historic preservation. People were a little bit uh, skeptical at first, but I am persistent and I know how to talk to people. So I went back night after night. Sometimes we talked about all kinds of other things as well. But in the end, our district was created with almost 80% buy-in, which is rare for a historic neighborhood. And it has resulted in a sense of place. We are very community-minded. I know every neighbor on our two blocks. And we had a party where we had a cake when we got finally our historic marker. So that's my favorite place. Thank you. So my name is Tim Plass, and uh, I'm currently on the council and seeking re-election. Uh, and my favorite place is Chautauqua. I have to say that it is one of the gems of Boulder. And it, it's a great historic place, but it's also a place for learning, um, for music, uh, for a gateway to our open space. So it combines so many of the wonderful aspects of Boulder, and it's just one of those real gems in our community, and that's a place I really like to be. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bill Riggler. Uh, I'm the director of university relations at Naropa University, and perhaps not surprisingly, Naropa is my favorite place in Boulder. <laughs> And not just physically, but uh, because of the connection that it has with our community in terms of promoting social impact, mindfulness, uh, and collaboration. Someone can sit there. Sorry. My name is Bob Yates. I brought the pineapple. Thank you. Beautiful, Bob. You're, you're welcome. That's endorsement material. <laughs> Was it local? <laughs> God only knows. You grew it in his backyard. <laughs> Without any fracking. No GMOs. Yeah. I, I dream of a boulder um, where people get around by bike, and if they can't ride a bike, they get on an electric bus for free. Um, I, dr I dream of a boulder that is um, less white and less rich. I dream of a boulder that um, people can live where they want including with people they're not related to. I dream of a boulder where um, we can have conversations um, without shouting it with each other. That's what I would like to see. I'm Cindy Carlisle, and my favorite place is Boulder Creek, probably the Ebon Fine area and to the west there, where today I saw a great, huge belted kingfisher and also an oozel which is a dipper, which feeds by going underwater. They're incredible birds and not seen that um, frequently in the city. So I also brought, since Waylon mentioned his birthday, a, a photograph of Waylon in the first grade in Mrs. Siaki's class, 1980-81. Now, I should probably pass this around and see who can find Waylon in here, starting with Waylon. So <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> yeah. There's Arunas. There's Barbara. <laughs> Barbara Siaki was the first grade teacher. Mrs. Yeah, Siaki. Yeah. Thank you so, for that. Well, that's also endorsement material. The okay. other, the other I'm, thing I want, I just okay. want to say, other thing about one other thing about Boulder Creek by Evan um, Fine. There, it holds such a diversity of that's people right. throughout the seasons Let's for see. different reasons. It's one of, I think, the most um, widely used diverse park spaces in the city, which is really fun. So was what? I'm sorry. One of the most widely diverse park spaces in the city was which. Evan Fine Park. Okay, thank you. Maybe, maybe people say Eben. I don't know. Yeah, I've always sorry. said Evan. Um, so, great. Thank you. So, that was quick, interesting, moving, fun, great, detailed, great start. 
Our first VIP question asker is Bob Morehouse. He goes first because he's eager to go to Mountain Sun and get his drink on. <laughs> so please just say your name, maybe briefly, why, who you are, I'm your Bob relationship. Bob Morehouse, a yeah. uh, longtime political junkie. And I have to say, it's really exciting to see so many wonderful, wonderful people vying for uh, the seats on the city council. I don't know what's wrong with all of you, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I really salute the quality and variety and all of the wonderful things going on. I have a quick question. Um, two years ago, there was a contentious issue that's hardly made the radar this year of municipalization. Several of you have brought it up, and my question is, let's say we do get through the thicket of lawsuits and the PUC and make it to uh, owning our own utility. What would you see we could do to innovate and make this a much more carbon-free city? So I'll assign, All right. or, or would you like to? Can, I think anybody wants to pick up okay, on that so question. Okay, to, so to keep this from being five hours, we're not going to ask everybody every question. So if you'd particularly like to answer this, or if you've been particularly vague on this issue, I'll ask, you to, I'll ask you to answer it. Would anyone like to jump in? Aaron? Yeah, it's a great question, Bob, because I've been, when I've been talking about municipalization, one of the big things to me that's exciting about it is the opportunity for innovation, because there are things that Excel won't let us do, and some things that the regulators won't let Excel do, and there are things like uh, energy districts, like uh, Fort Zed in Fort Collins, which lets you take a whole uh, neighborhood, you know, and work on energy issues together, or solar gardens where we're really limited in the amount that we're able to have in the in the state, and we could do as many as we wanted, you know, or microgrids where you, um, you know, build your own, uh, you know, distributed generation of, of, of energy. So I think there are all kinds of amazing things we could accomplish if we can get out from under Excel. Can we see some, uh, do people agree with that or disagree with that? Yeah. Anyone, was anyone sticker down? I missed it. Hey, we're doing a really cool thing right now called Rooftop Solar Tool, which shows the solar potential on every rooftop in Boulder. And that's the kind of thing that we can harness when we have our own municipal utility. And we can, everybody can be a part of producing the energy and sharing it with their neighbors or, well, their neighbors and their neighborhoods. And we can all be a part of the energy solution. I think that's a really exciting potential for what we can do. Is anyone here not a fan? <coughs> is that the question? Is anyone here not a fan? I was for it before I was for it. Right. <laughs> well said. Well I, be said. I believe maybe Don, who is not here, yeah. okay. is not a big fan. Okay. So uh, that was two people. Anyone else want to jump in? Sure. Tim? Oh, was that Bill or Tim? Okay. Great. I'll be really quick. I mean, I think that we can. As a utility, we'll be able to decide where we buy our power, our purchase, our power purchase agreements. We can decide. We can do more renewables. That's huge. Second piece, and, and Zan talked about this a little bit, lower, um, lower barriers to get on the grid and try innovation and technology. And I think that if we have that kind of ability here in Boulder, we could really have a great new industry spawn around, spawned around our ability to try out innovative new technologies uh, for, for electricity. Does that satisfy your... Question, or would you like to hear a few? Okay, maybe one more, Bill, or sure. only if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I don't think that we've been able to successfully do just yet is work as closely with Boulder's innovation economy as we otherwise could. So just to echo what Tim has been saying, Boulder has been at the forefront of startups and tech companies and being able to utilize and work more closely with these tech companies to have really disruptive approaches to renewables, uh, I think is a smart way to go, but it also is going to lead to jobs and a cleaner planet. But on Muni, do you have thoughts on Muni? Because I think, so Bill's, Bill's a friend, full disclosure, um, and he's a little newer to town, so municipalization has been something you're getting to, you know, wrapping your head around. So where are you at on it? Oh, no, pro, no muni. pro Muni, pro-Muni all the way. All right. Is that on record, Reggie? Not that I have an opinion on it. Right. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much, Bob. Um, Next up, Maybe who? Yeah, why don't you? Okay. 
How about neighborhoods? Crystal Gray? Okay, great. Crystal Gray. No. Please say your name. Most people Crystal here won't Gray. know you. Crystal Gray. I was on city council, <laughs> and you guys are the reason I'm not on city council, because you're all so good choices. Well, seven, five of you. So, <laughs> but I want to welcome you to my neighborhood, the Whittier neighborhood. So my question is about neighborhoods, but it's not about the neighborhood right to vote. But here's what my question is. As you as individuals change and as the city and as our life changes, how do you see your, your neighborhood, which you're living in, evolve? And maybe you could mention some specifics that you might either see things, how they might evolve, or changes you sh think you'd like to have made, and how do you have that conversation with your neighbors? Thank you. So maybe we'll, we'll do a little bit of a speed round so we can get everyone to answer this one, but within that, try and be detailed. Don't just say more a community. Say something detailed, identify your community. I'm, I live in the West Pearl community, which is incredibly diverse right now. We have everything from light industrial to low income to um, residential, retail, residential, low, medium, and dense, the densest. So in terms of evolution, um, it's hard. we also have group living um, in the sense that there are multiple unrelated in some of the rental houses. And I think that kind of thing is measured by impact. It's a cohesive neighborhood in the sense that uh, everything fits. We're really close to the downtown, to the mall. It's so hard to think of how it would. Is the kind of thing you want or you, what you want to see How change? it would evolve. Oh, yeah. As life evolves, yeah. it might, some of these group homes might be for seniors rather than younger people. That kind of thing may be happening there as uh, in the next 10 years so or so. So maybe that's. Energy becomes more scarce or as uh -huh. So maybe we'll make it a little shorter. So identify where you're at and one thing you'd like to see evolve or change. I live in uh, Melody Catalpa, which is in the near north side, uh, just right off of Iris. And uh, we're already seeing changes, Crystal, in our neighborhood. Uh, more and more of the houses are, are uh, accepting people that are not related to them, three or four people living in, in, in the homes, as diversity of the community, and I think it's great. Thank you. Uh, so far, uh, and I say so far, the two most heavily coveted endorsements in this race are from Open Boulder and Better Boulder. I've received both of them in large part because of my great emphasis on housing. Uh, workforce housing is the defining issue of this campaign. And, but how does so that relate to the neighborhood and how does that relate to the neighborhood do you live in? Sure. Neighborhood. I, I live in the Uptown Broadway neighborhood, uh, which is a 15 minute neighborhood, uh, and I absolutely love it. But uh, I think it's a, really another crucial distinction is that I'm only I'm one of the few candidates up here that rents, and so creating mechanisms for more people, especially workforce uh, uh, workers, public sector employees, to be able to afford to live in Boulder is crucial. Thank you. So I, I live on Mapleton Hill, and there's one thing I'd love to see. On my block, there was historically a grocery store, Daisy Grocery, which was a mom and pop grocery store, which was the grocery was down below, they lived up above. And it, they can't do that any longer. It was a non-conforming use, can't happen. I'd love to see that become some kind of, I don't know, my neighbors probably wouldn't like a bar. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that'd be too bad, but I would love to see it be a coffee shop or a, 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 a gathering place for people, kind of back to the future. And just one other point, so there used to be a trolley that ran up my street too. Wow. And kind of, you know, you can see the historic pictures of the trolley. And so, you know, we talk about public transportation. It would be great right. to see us get something that works. I, I don't know if a trolley would work, but, but it was so. Okay, the trolley will work. She says it will. Okay. But it's just so cool. Okay, sure. There you go. Well, I live on the hill, so maybe I should get 15 minutes because we have so many issues there. But I that's think. That's not what a 15 minute neighborhood is. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's what we need 15 minutes of discussion about how to get to be. But I think uh, Uni Hill used to be a 15 minute neighborhood. In the commercial area, there used to be three grocery stores and multiple clothing stores and shoe stores. And all the residents of the hill went down and shopped there. I'd like to see us getting back to that a little. It has become very student centric. I would like to have it become more varied in its uses and uh, have some of the faculty return to uh, living there. When we moved into our house, we were the 
my husband was the only faculty member who lived on our block, on two, three, four blocks, really. And it's good for them to live there because they can walk to work. It's so easy. It's the green thing to do. And I think if professors live among the students, mm -hmm. maybe student behavior might be a little moderated also. Mm -hmm. And if junior faculty lives on the hill, they might be more academic uh, fertilization in the university. Thank you. Let's keep Hi. on. Well, I, I live um, at the Secret Garden, it's, a, it's an industrial site um, <laughs> right now. And there, uh, I've got a place that's grandfathered in as a residence. Uh, but my area is, is rapidly changing or, you know, things are on the chopping block. A lot of it has to do with, um, you know, value, uh, you know, redevelopment. I think we, we're trying to do a lot. I'm a big proponent of affordable housing. I think there's a lot of great opportunities up in the neighborhood. Um, they're, they're looking at annexation of um, some of what, what's called Naderville, up in <laughs> the, the warehouses in, in the area. But there are al already people there with businesses who are, you know, artists and service providers that uh, I would like to not see get pushed out. I would like to see them being incorporated into the plan and how we um, preserve uh, some of those existing functions and, and people and not, not just push people out to build more housing. Cool. So I live in North Boulder, the new North Boulder that is used to be called Dog Patch. And most of the people who live in my neighborhood are people, working class people, who basically bought their lot and built their house themselves. Um, I, with my former husband, we built the first structural adobe house in the city of Boulder. Our, my energy bills are less than $150 a year. And um, what I see for my neighborhood is I see infill, I see a diverse community, I see ADUs, OAUs, I see co-ops. We have the kind of density that can support that kind of housing. And we need to step up to the plate in order to make sure that people who are here can live here, and that's the younger people in this community as well as our seniors. So we can so do it. Can you just explain for the people who don't go to city council meetings all the time? I'm what? sorry. No, no, no. You were that was great. But what ADUs and whatever okay, else? Okay, ADUs are accessory dwelling units, and that means you have a structure and you can okay, add. Yeah. A, no, it, oh. it means that you have a structure, and to that you can add basically an apartment that you can rent out for somebody. It's a controversial and, thing that helps density, but a lot of right. people but don't want. Right, but if any want, neighborhood yeah. can handle it, this neighborhood can. Uh, OAUs are um, occupied, uh, I mean owner accessory units, and those are more like carriage houses. They're limited to 450 square feet. They're limited in terms of de number of units in, the, in a particular area. We need to change that. That really needs to be changed. We also need to change the co-op um, ordinance in order to let more people live in. That's for you. Um, I live on Uni Hill. And I also think the city needs to have much more creativity in terms of the types of structures that we allow, including accessory dwelling units and OAUs. And I'm also for co-housing. I think that we need to work closer with the university on some of the issues for the Uni Hill area. Um, my company, actually, we make um, small homes, tiny homes, and ADUs from shipping containers. And there's no place to put them in the whole city. So. Um, I think it's a problem that could really help us. It's a solution that could actually help us uh, in all areas of town. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, Aaron Brockett here again. Um, so as I mentioned, I live in the Holiday neighborhood, um, which is mostly new, new built, and, and not, there's not a lot of change going on right in there. But along North Broadway, we really could use some, some new services there and some new housing. So I'd like to see uh, our neighborhood continue to evolve into the kind of the urban village that it's been moving towards. Um, and so new workforce housing, new walkable things you can get to, but while still preserving some of the funkier, uh, older industrial commercial spaces like Ed's space up at the Secret Garden. And the other big thing I'd love to see is more transit. So we have a great transit route downtown in the skip. There's no transit whatsoever that goes along US 36. I think a lot of people would take the bus where they currently take their car if we had good transit into like the 29th Street area. Thank you. Hello again, I'm Comrade Keith Percy. I live in North Boulder by the rec center. I happen to be, I believe, the only candidate that uh, lives on a housing voucher and uh, disability checks. So something I'd really like to see is I'd like to see 
more accessibility even in my apartment which is beautiful there's an accessible unit on each floor so there's three floors three accessible units and at least five or six people that i know of who personally have disabilities so we we have to work on if we're going to be an open creative innovative and accepting boulder as we like to believe we are we have to work on things like accessibility visibility there's a lot of visibility plans that are being put into effect into much bigger cities than ours like Austin, Texas. We need to really be innovators if we're gonna be innovators and we need to include everybody. We need a voucher system that works. I'm on a voucher and when I got my voucher, they said it'll be 13 months and you'll be at the top of the list in 13 months. Plan accordingly. Now because of the stresses of that system and because you know disability advocates such as myself don't like to have waiting lists, we said, let's do it different. So they came up with a lotto system. So now you have three weeks and you're in the lotto, you put in a application for a voucher, and if you're lucky, you get your number pulled and you know there might be a voucher available and then you have to look for your housing. What's happening is that we have lotto winners that have now been waiting two years for some vouchers to be available because as bad as the waiting list was, at least you knew you were going to come up on it. So, so we is, need to really this innovate. Is important, this is a vital issue, and we do care about it. We want to answer the questions that are asked, ideally. Absolutely. That's what I'm doing. I'm, Fantastic. I'm telling you the, the, the future of Boulder that I'd time. like to see. We're going to be here late, so let's just keep it timely. I appreciate that, and thank you. So who's next? Ryan? Yeah. Want to ask my question? Yep. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> Um, I'm worried that Boulder's not very weird anymore. Hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was born and raised here. Sorry, I'm like, there's cameras everywhere. I don't know where I should stand. I was born and raised right here. There. I love Boulder with all my heart. I love a lot of the weird things about Boulder, not just the events like Kinetics or the Mall Crawl or Naked Pumpkin Run, but the uh, c outdoor concerts and other funky things that made Boulder Boulder. And so uh, I just... I guess I could, I'll ask uh, Bill, maybe, and Suzanne, and whoever else wants to you know, chime in about how we can keep Boulder, but not weird, but just like keep it a little bit funky, like, you let's know? Start, let's start down here on the end. Are we gonna do everybody? No, just oh. three. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah. right here. You wanna talk about the disability more? I mean, that's one good way to keep this okay. town weird. Uh, yes, uh, one, one way that I would continue to make Boulder weird is that, for instance, I, I'm a queer disabled acti activist and I can't get into out Boulder. And despite the, facts, the fact that I went to po polyamory meetups there for many years, I had to crawl up those stairs to do it. So I think if we're really going to continue to be weird, we have to build weird culture, weird queer culture, weird art culture, and that means that it can't just be capitalism. It can't just be some tents in Central Park that we set up and we say buy a flag, buy some wine. We have to create music and art and openness for everybody. Woo. Yeah. Yeah. So Zan? I don't know how I got chosen, but cool. Well, I like you, I want you to <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Because dudes have says. All right, we're not gonna argue with that. Um, two things I think are really important. I think you keep it real, keep it weird, if you keep it inclusive or even make it more inclusive. So I think that's where the housing thing comes in. I think that's really real. I think that's co-ops. I think that's permanently <laughs> affordable. I think it's also the transitional housing we did for the chronically homeless and also the ready to work folks. I think it's doing the full diversity. So I think that's one thing. And then the other is kind of on the arts ends of the spectrum. And I think finally the issue of arts has ripened here in, in Boulder. And we're getting ready to do a lot more, I think, public funding of arts, both supporting artists and doing more public art. And I think that also helps kind of keep us all feeling creative. So those are two, two right. things. Thank you. And then Bill? Uh, I have aspirations of Boulder being the coolest fucking city on the planet. Um, the way that we're going to do that is by making sure that we have housing for people so they can afford to live here. Right now, we've got the middle of the barbell that's completely gone. We've got low income, and we've got very wealthy. 
people can't afford to live here. I spent a lot of time living in New York City before moving to Colorado, and you had a vibrancy and a diversity, socioeconomic, uh, geographic, uh, ethnic, and this melting pot was spectacular, and that's what Boulder can and should become. Uh, this diversity of ideas is what makes us great and what makes us the number one place in the country to live, and we should be the number one place in the world to live, and that's only gonna, be, that's only gonna happen if we create this welcoming and enabling environment for people to come. Uh, beyond that, I think that, uh, Doozer, we need you to get more videos out there. So I'm gonna ask a follow-up as moderator. So that sounded good, but, but San Francisco and other towns are losing diversity by the day, so as are we what little we had, class diversity. <laughs> um, you know, I grew up here with my, my mom couldn't afford to keep her house, um, that kind of thing, la la la. Um, we didn't get a TV, we didn't get chips, we didn't get pizza. Um, we, didn't, we didn't have a car. We were, d yeah, well no, we couldn't afford a violin. We did have a, what's the big, uh, the, the big pipe kind of thing? I think Crystal, I think Crystal, you should run again. <laughs> Some trash talk. So specifically, how do we uh, resist the increasing yuppieization of Boulder? Uh, again, it comes down to housing prices. Um, the average home price in Boulder is $100,000 higher than it is in neighboring communities. Um, rental prices are only going to continue to go up as companies like Google and others come in. We've got to create opportunities for everybody here in this room to be able to live and work and enjoy Boulder. Um, but I want to also go back to something that Zan said. I mean, without more public support for arts and something that creates an opportunity for artists to come in of all walks in life, of musicians and others, um, we're going to be uh, a group of a very wealthy uh, enclave of white people. Ideas for housing, though? No. Specific ideas for housing, I think, is, is what... Oh, is specifics. Because specific? everyone here will say the same nice thing. Right. Uh, I think that the city purchase of, uh, of rental units um, that can be used and set aside specifically for workforce housing, teachers, uh, police officers, nurses, teachers, and others. Thank you so much. Thank you. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to be quick, but also a little in depth. And if any of you feel like the bullshitometer is going off, which I'm not saying it did, but if it's too, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not. I love this man. But if it's yeah, too general, you know, just grumble audibly. Amy, with a Hi, question. Hi, I'm Amy Hayes, and I'm an independent graphic designer, longtime resident, and um, also an owner of a short-term rental, so that's like VRBO, Airbnb. And my question for the council is, um, and just a teeny bit of background, I couldn't afford to live in Boulder if it weren't for the short-term income, and I know all of my friends, I have probably five friends who do it, and the same is true for them. So how do you... Um, plan to vote, or, or what is your opinion of the legalization of short-term rentals? And um, open up a window. Yeah. If you are in favor of it, why limit the number of days versus the number of permits on a block? Because limiting the number of days essentially means it's not feasible. And also, if you're not in favor of it, why? Somebody should explain maybe what we what we passed. Yeah, that sounds good. Could we do that real quick, and then? just so everybody knows what the deal is. And you guys can correct me if I say this wrong. So th what the ordinance we passed was to legalize short-term rentals with a few caveats. And one is if it's in your permanent residence, unlimited. So you can rent out your rooms, you go on vacation, you can rent out your whole house, no limits. If you don't, if it's not your permanent residence, you can't. So, and that the whole purpose of that is to keep investor Investors from buying up houses here and turning them into tourist hotels. Okay, we love Zan. Well, no, especially okay. Doozer, but we got to share the mic. Okay, I was just explaining yeah. what we passed. So everybody, it, the only limits are the only limits helpful, are yeah. the 120 days. Is if you have a, another unit, a carriage house out back, you can only do that 120 days. And the idea behind that is simply we want to make it so that you there's an incentive to do long-term rentals instead of short-term rentals. To get at the housing issue. And if you're a renter, you can't steal it off the street. Correct. That's correct yeah. right now, yeah. but it's going to come back. So, okay. so Lisa, that's what did it is. you want to speak to? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> What's that? Pardon me. Depend, it's dependent on the tax passing. Correct. Right. If the tax doesn't pass, there are no short Right. And I have some issues with that, mm -hmm. you know, because I think it's here. I would like to see. Um, short-term rentals surface so that they're legal 
so that we have a baseline so that we know what's here. Um, I agree with Zan in terms of when they're in, in your home, you can do it unlimited. Um, but when it's a, um, an accessory unit or something like that, then we put a limit on that. Or a second one home. Of the, one of the, a, a second, second home. home. Yeah. So one of the things that we are working very hard on, and I answered previously, was these OAUs, ADUs, and um, co-ops and, and uh, boarding houses. And it has been an issue that we've been working on for at least 20 years in order to get um, um, gentle, <coughs> gentle infill in the lower density neighborhoods with that can accept it. And I think our big issue is, or part of our issue, is that if we want to get these smaller units for the larger number of people, um, they have to be retained for long-term rental. Okay, so who can we pass it to who hasn't been speaking lately? Leonard? Yeah. So Leonard May again, and I absolutely agree with the direction the council's going in. I think the critical thing is when you open the doors completely to short-term rentals, if you're removing um, housing stock from the general long-term rental market, you're exacerbating the affordability issues. Another critical component of that is the extent to which you allow it. It can become destabilizing and disruptive to a neighborhood. You're, you have to go to work the next day and the folks next door are partying because they're on vacation. And there are neighborhoods, for instance, in San Francisco, I went to a, a, a planning conference a couple of months ago where whole neighborhoods, like whole blocks, have flipped beyond 50% short-term rental and it makes life very difficult for the folks who remain there and are not doing that. So I think the city's done exactly the right balance on doing this. I think I might quibble a little bit about, about the number of days uh, where you can do a short-term rental if you're not there. This is like you go on vacation for you know, four months, and I think the city did 120 days, right? Um, so you might quibble about that, but I think generally uh, they took the right approach. It's just for accessory going. It's for yeah. accessory yeah. going, yeah. not for your house. Right. No. Okay. For your house, it's so, unlimited. Okay. Awesome. Um, so Mariah has a quick question. Just can you give us a, are you, are you for VRBO short-term rentals as we just pass them? As just the, in, as a general as thing? As is as there as anyone as against, as against them? Okay, great. Anyone against them? What do you mean, four Airbnbs and VRBOs existing in Boulder? Yeah, there. Are, yeah, I mean that's I think what it, one thing Amy wanted to know. She said well, everyone, no one's banning yeah. it. No okay, one's here. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Okay, yep. I think the question I, I would yep. ask, if I may, and I love you, um, is, <laughs> are we generally are we generally for limiting their impact on neighborhoods, Absolutely. Um, yeah. but doing so in a way that allows people to you know reasonably make income and stay in town? I see. I would like. To that's see too that. easy to agree with, I guess. Yeah. Because I think on the hill. Uh, there are many, many uses that could be allowed if people had a feeling that there would be some enforcement or rules around them. It's the kind of chaotic atmosphere that you have on the Hill and the fact that we feel that people come in and use this as, you know, as income generating things rather than something that helps someone like you to remain in your home by right. renting out a space in your home. Right. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. So next... Are you reasonably satisfied, Amy? Was that at all helpful? A little bit. There's nuances, but I think yeah. it's fine. Devil's in the details, right? Yeah. Like That's why we have them do the. So, how maybe. So, maybe one person could speak specifically to uh, people like Amy who are, you know, they're not absentee owners. Like, I have a guy or a house two doors down. I've never yeah. had a neighbor in eight nine years because he rent he rents out the whole thing he doesn't live there and but so people like yourself let's let's have um an ex days means I can't do it. let's have cindy or bob would either of you like to jump in on that I mike guess. i've got something to say about keeping boulder weird now that uh, Bill has broken the ice here, I say bring back the fucking cowboy bars. You know. <laughs> okay, that was that was awesome, but um, a little a little bit Donald Trumpy, which I don't expect from you, Cindy. <laughs> we we want a specific answer to this citizen who is trying to stay in town. 
Yeah, I think we need to relook at what types of units are um, restricted to that 100-day policy because I think that that should really be for a second home and not somebody's home and a piece connected to it or a piece in on the same property. I think that that shouldn't have a limit at all. Was that at all helpful? <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I wasn't making a comment. I'm just I want I want people to actually get answers a little bit. Please. Can you say your name? Susan Ross. Woo. And um, I've lived in a uh, house in Marnakers that I owned. I've lived in rental housing in Boulder, and I currently live in a house in Vista Village. And uh, if you've, I don't know if there's anybody else here who's lived in mobile homes in Boulder, but um, the, the difficult thing about my house is I don't actually own the lot that it's on. And so even though it might function as a small house or a wonderful uh, neighborhood, it could all go away in 30 days. That's what we have. And so there's a lot of us. And it's, there's a lot of people who are university professors and teachers and you know, school principals and, you know, and retired city people. So <laughs> and question. Question is, uh, what are you going to do about that? <laughs> no, no, sorry. Lisa, I love you. You're knowledgeable. Would you like to go, either of you two down here? We've got to mix it up a little bit. We can't just have the charming, eloquent, knowledgeable people. Jan Burton, I, I would not support anything like that where it, it would go away in 30 days. And in general, I think mobile homes are a great option. It's small living. We should encourage more of that rather than less. And just that one of, I think one of the keys to pre keeping Boulder weird and a diverse uh, group of people here is preserving our mobile home parks. Mm -hmm. And the way that we can do that is by land trusting them. And where you buy the land, you know, f as the city or Boulder, ha Boulder Housing Partners, it's expensive, but it's one of the projects we should be working on, which is exactly what Lisa will tell you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Out of turn. Um, she's feisty. She's still got it. What's that? Oh, uh, yes, a uh, Mariah. Do we have a Mariah? <laughs> okay, so yeah, I wanted to, I've got a transportation question for you. Do you mind standing up? I don't <laughs> mind. <laughs> you can't, may not tell, though, because I'm so short. But um, Yeah, I so asked you to stand up. So. <laughs> okay, so my question is, I don't want to talk about right-sizing or anything like that. Um, my question, though, around transportation is, you know, more than 25 years ago, you know, we as a community, you know, committed to reducing our single occupancy miles traveled or, you know, VMT, et cetera. We've done a horrible job of this. And, I mean, I'm a transportation advocate. I was on the transportation board, et cetera. So, um, We've done in, um, right now, if, if we had, uh, if we were going to meet our goals, we would be down 15%. We're only down 5%. Mm. So we're, we're not going to make our goals. In over the, approximately the same period of time, the city of Amsterdam went from a very car-friendly place to a radically bike-centric place. We have 72% of city staff living outside of the city more than 12 miles away, which means beyond Longmont. And so my question is, do you have a vision for how Boulder can become a remarkable bike city? I'd like to just hear your specific ideas. Thank you. So let's, uh, who has it? Bob. Um, I, think it's, I think it's bikes, but it's bikes plus. Um, first on bikes, I, I, I don't think, I used to serve on the Greenways Board. Um, I don't think there's, a, there's, there's too many bike paths and too many bike routes we could have in this town. We need to continue. We have a $33 million backlog. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need to continue to build bike paths and bike routes to make backlog. it very, very easy. What does that, mean? that means we have a long list of things that we could do, we want to do, but we haven't spent, haven't dedicated the money to do that. Okay. It's just the money. It's just wow. money. Um, second, um, buses. A lot of, not everyone can ride bikes, um, and, and a, lot, a lot of people are a long ways away. People are physically limited, and so it's buses. I want a system wide free Ecom Fest. When I say system, I don't mean just the city of Boulder. I mean people coming in from outside of Boulder to come in on, on buses, electric buses, absolutely free to anyone who lives here and works here. So is there a so question to follow up there with RTD yes. yeah, or I mean, how would we actually do I that? Mean, I've worked with RTD for you know, a long time and I can just, I mean, how are you going to make that, what, what that hasn't been done already, what are you going to do? To, I mean, like, how, how are you going to do that? I love problems that are fixable by money. Okay, this is a money problem. This is not an RTD problem. We 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 own the hop. We run the hop. We can we can run more buses. All we have to do is be willing to pay for them. Very good. I was hoping you'd say like all Trump. Yeah, Just I to go back to Trump, I'll talk to them. I'll talk to RTD. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a businessman. I, I would say I would say fu I would say fuck RTD and yeah. let's do it ourselves. <laughs> all right. Who's next? Okay, whoever you want. Mariah, pick people. Lisa. 
I think it's time to throw RTD out. And I think it's time that we consider an overlay zone in the city in Boulder, and county of Boulder where we provide our own transit system. We municipalize or countyize our transit system so that, you know, we can control. I've been waiting for a decade for a frequent headway on true. North 204. It's ridiculous. We're never going to get there as long as we stay with RTD. It's time to divorce. It's time to municipalize or countyize our own transportation system, and we need to become our own district that works with RTD in the interface zone where we can still get regional transportation, but that we have a much better say in terms of eco city, uh, countywide eco passes and frequent, and, uh, frequent busways and, and good headways. Let's go to Cha Cha real quick. Ah, oh, jeez. Okay. <laughs> So if people entering late can just enter through the wall into this room, great. <laughs> so transportation and housing are very closely linked and I've heard a lot of great transportation ideas. Housing also fixes transportation problems if we can have our development be infill development and close to existing shopping centers and having 15 minute neighborhoods, that gets people out of their cars. They don't need to get into them to go down the street. Okay, Zan. I was just going to say that Mary Young and I sit on a working group with elected officials in every municipality in Boulder County and Boulder County and Boulder County staff to figure out how you would design an eco pass program to deal with the entire county and what it would look like and how we can put it on the ballot for 2016. So if it can be done, we are going to figure it out collectively with the entire region and do it next year. Okay, so I'm going to ask a question of the crowd. How are you feeling? You don't, this isn't, a, this isn't a, a party with dudes or a beer garden. Are you feeling exhausted? Do you like more detail or, or would you like more detail? We can keep going a bit or we can, I mean, I'd like more detail, but if you all are tired, we can kind of skip some stuff. Right yeah. So, so does that, no, we're not going to ask yes, no questions. We're going to get into actually understand, most, too many people say the right thing in these. All right. Next, we have Mary. Uh, because we didn't talk with you, Mary, uh, beforehand, I don't know what you're going to ask. If you want to ask something, now's your chance. If you don't, um, future state senator Steve Fenberg is also here to jump in with a question. So Mary or Steve, if you'd like to ask a question. Or Mary. Or Mary. 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 Okay, three, two. Steve, do you have something? Bob already asked about muni. Okay. So next we have oh, the love. Have okay, Mary. <laughs> so um, this so isn't a political party where we all shout each other out. This everybody is, here talks about um, inclusion and awesome. diversity, and um, but yet we're not. We never have been. How do we change that? Sorry, I'm sorry. What was the? How do we change that? You don't. Which? We have. We have remained steady. One percent people black people mm. yeah. we are at eight percent latinos and i believe we are four percent asian um and that those needles haven't moved and um so how do we change that so ed has this been a little while yeah and maybe <coughs> I think we need to celebrate the culture of diversity um, and find sites throughout the city that, that are within neighborhoods and where people can, can come together and really have an authentic cultural exchange. So um, I don't, I don't want to keep going back to it, but at my place I've got a bunch of African guys who will put on a reggae night every once in a while. We'll put on, um, you know, African, uh, I mean, uh, Japanese, uh, programs with you know various Japanese arts that they're doing and you know that that's what I'd like to see around town where we identify sites give those sites the flexibility to do that and and become community gathering spaces and, and directly yeah. connecting with this question maybe and I'm not interrupting this Mary um, maybe piggybacking on this because it's intimately connected we have Ashley Hitchcock with a question um, do you mind jumping in Oh, yeah, you need the mic. Thank you. So I was going to ask a question about um, affordable housing, but I feel like that's what everybody's been talking about tonight. 
Well, maybe just tell your story and your, your frustration or experience. So I, I've lived in Boulder over 20 years, and I've never really had a problem finding a super cheap place to live, and I'm really lucky, and I'm really connected in the community and um, very resourceful. But last, last year, we, um, we had a great house to live in, and my landlord had to sell it. And he gave us some notice, and we were looking, looking, looking. We couldn't find anything, like at all. And I am great at finding a place to live. So, so the moving day came and went, and we, um, I have three kids and a dog, and we went four different directions, and we're homeless for six weeks. So our friends took us in, our families, um, and it was great. And we, there is such little affordable housing for rentals in this town. We put our application in at Thistle and waited on the, it took them six weeks to process our application. So y there's great affordable housing for people who can afford to buy a house, but what about renters? Um, and I've heard a lot of great ideas that you guys came up with today, yeah, but um, I think the affordable housing thing could really solve like the diminishing class diversity. Is the dog yeah. back there? I absolutely agree because I have many friends who live in our mobile home parks and there they can afford to live in what feels like a home with a little garden and they can be outdoors. My friend Ginger who lives in Orchard Grove, she has a little free library just outside her uh, front door and she curates that so all the neighborhood kids know that they can come there and she changes the books around when she sees things aren't moving or she wants to incentivize some particular thing. So I think the people who live in uh, our mobile home parks are very varied. They're very skilled. They're, they are our teachers, our firemen, our you know, young professors and thereabouts. Ginger herself is a very good photographer and she teaches in our city schools. So this is exactly the kind of person we would like to keep here. And there is a great deal of diversity. When I visited her, I saw a lot of people who were Latino, who were of different ethnicities. I know the Nepali community is quite big in uh, Boulder. And I know they tend to, they like to live close to each other so that they can have that feeling of community. And they're great people. And I think all these communities have celebrations of their own. And I think those celebrations are sometimes on our civic core and we have them on Pearl Street and all that, but let's just do more of that. Let's have what I experienced in India growing up when we used to celebrate every holiday of every community together. So uh, maybe cha-cha. Let's do a little speed round so we could get to a couple people on this one. So this is Mary's question on diversity or lack thereof. Ashley's as maybe affordable renting is connected to that, right? So regarding Ashley's question, um, Jan runs an awesome business that um, has restrictions because uh, because there's the laws prevent um, people from using shipping homes as accessory dwelling units or other things like that. Um, so I think changing some laws to allow cooperatives, to allow more people to live in a home, and to allow more people to have smaller units that are added to their um, places can definitely help with that. As far as inclusion, um, we need to have trainings. We need to train our city staff and everybody who works for the city in inclusive inclusivity. We need to do racial justice trainings. We need to teach people about social justice in general and why society as ex is excluding people and what we can do about it. I, not to be too controversial here, but when I attended Naropa, we had countless classes about that kind of thing, which was wonderful. And all those classes were taken by almost 100% white <laughs> affluent people. And I was always saying, less classes and more scholarships, you know, make it more accessible. Yeah. Actually walk our talk. So I'd love to hear more, you know, like your first thing that you said, like the how to keep it affordable or, how, you know, Naropa and CU or certainly our gateways to diversity for Boulder. Anyone else? Bob? Oh, sorry. Can I go? Yeah, if we can keep them short, we can yeah, get to, uh, I'd love to no more than five hear minutes. from a lot of people on this. Uh, Leonard May again. Uh, so somebody mentioned affordability, of course, is part of the issue, but employment is another aspect of it. If you saw the recent trends report, 
Uh, the Latino community in Boulder County is one of the most highly educated in the country, yet there's a significant achievement gap. Um, and so when we look at our economic development, we also have to be looking at whether we're providing the kinds of jobs that people here need. Um, if you look at something, and this is not bashing tech, but it's a reality. If you look at Google coming in, there are not 1,200 software engineers looking for work that currently live in Boulder. So as we continue to move in that direction, those kinds of imbalances create more hardship for people here that um, are in minority communities or in lower income sector of, of the uh, local population. So again, going back to Google, they come here. Um, there is now an increased demand for housing as a result of 1,200 new, potentially 1,200 new highly paid people coming in. We still have that achievement gap in the Latino community. Their prices are going up for housing. The employment needs aren't getting met. And that kind of reconciling of these disparate uh, trajectories needs to be dealt with. Cool. I think we're almost at 30 seconds now. So let's get to Tim. I just went No, in. Tim. <laughs> so I'll be quick. Tim is so quiet. We got to <laughs> So we need to preserve the affordability that we have. And we're working on that. That's key. We don't want to see any more erosion. We can do some things with our permanently affordable program. We have a 10% goal. We're at 8% right now, and I think we need to look at upping that. So and how do we do that? Yeah. Well, we're, we need to put more, more money into it. I think one of the conversations we need to have is what are the funding sources? Yeah. And then the last piece um, that I'd like to see us is to enable the market to try to, pr to produce more of relatively affordable housing. It's a challenge. But how do we do that? Can we look at micro units? Can we look at unbundling parking? I mean, all these things can make it less expensive, I think, and, and putting it in your transit, all those things that we need to try to do. So maybe a specific question. I, I, I'm pretty ignorant about this, but it seems like most of the developments I see going up are fancy condos and such. Developers want to make money. How are we going to encourage or force developers to, um, you know, help fund affordable housing? So they do help fund it. We have an inclusionary housing but ordinance, which requ requires 20% affordable. That, that means 80% of the units are not necessarily affordable. And right? they're not getting built, right, the 20%? Yeah. Well, they're, they're, we are getting them. It could be cash in lieu, or they could, they could be a receiving site off of where that's being built. Or they, some of them are actually produced on site, but uh -huh. not as many, I think. We'd so like where's to see the 20% more. getting? Is it getting built? It's off site. Huh? It's mostly off site. It's not because a lot of I would love for Lisa to be able to talk. For once, <laughs> could we give her the mic? You know, I, I know I've talked a lot, so I'm, I'm going no, to give up the mic. Yeah. Lisa? Sorry not to get to you, Lisa. So what's happening is most of the apartments that are being built, we don't have rent control in the state, and so that's an issue. And so the apartments that are being built aren't affordable for, per se, and so their affordable housing stock is built off-site which doesn't produce a mixed type of community. Um, I think we need to look at the state legislature, Steve, and, and to look at rent control once again. And you know, the city of Boulder, it's amazing. We don't have any uh, bilingual people there to speak to people mm -hmm. of different languages. And what a difference that would make right. if we had Spanish and Hmong and Vietnamese speakers when we have uh, events for people who are coming from all over the community. We have over, you know, 28, 35 <coughs> different kind of cultural communities in this town. We need to make them feel more part of the community. We need to speak their language. Thank you. Zan? Just one other idea. The Boulder Community Hospital site, I think, offers us a wonderful opportunity to try to make some of this happen. It'll probably take some interesting public-private partnerships to pay for some of this, but that is an opportunity for us to really push for the mix that we want to see. Okay, we're well over time, so unless anyone urgently, I'm gonna go to um, Michelle, who has a question about, do you mind standing, just so folks can see you? Hi, my name is Michelle Estrella, and I helped found a group called Open Boulder, which is why I think I'm invited tonight. Mm. And, <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask, well, we, we, we have a very vibrant economy here, and I think a lot of us are still working class, middle income, or less people. 
and uh, jobs are important to us. So I'd like to know whether you guys um, believe it's your role as a council member and as city government to control the number and types of jobs that we have here within the city. So and I'd love to hear from people. Okay. Or Jan. Yeah, so I mean, uh, there been, there's been talk in town of, you know, limiting the number of jobs or reducing the number of jobs. You know, I, I don't think we should be doing that. I think, you know, economic vitality is important here and the ability for particularly younger people to find a, a job in town is important. But at the same time, there, there are issues with affordability as we add employment. So if you've seen some of the recent projections, we're looking at adding a lot more jobs than housing. And I think that's, that's skewed. I think we need to kind of retune uh, how our plans for the city are organized right now to make sure that we're getting more housing as we move forward with our new development in those kind of mixed use uh, new neighborhoods where you can walk and bike and take the bus. And so de-emphasize the new construction on commercial while allowing some of it to happen. Instead, tilt towards the housing that'll give us some, that'll help us work on the affordability issues, help build some new communities for new folks to live in and some different housing types as we move forward. Thank you. Hi, Jim. Um, do we want Bob or Bill or Cindy? It's been a little while. Can I answer? Oh, Jan, yeah. please. Yeah, I, thanks, I said that too. Jan, I love her. <laughs> um, I think it's the council's job to represent the people. And there was a community survey done in 2014, and people are very concerned about jobs, about job growth and employment growth. So I think it is the council's job to represent the people and continue with economic development to ensure that there are opportunities for people to work. Right, so, um, so Mariah uh, is reminding me uh, specific, so how? Any, Any specific ideas? ideas? Oh, you know, um, specific ideas. Well, you know, I think there, there are things that for example, we do have an economic development person that works with uh, startups to encourage them to come in and to grow. And startups, of course, one of their concerns is uh, the price of expansion, office space. So I think continuing to work with, um, you know, with the planning department, et cetera, to ensure that there's the right amount of office space for companies to grow is one thing that we can do so that companies don't have to move out of Boulder when they, when they grow. Okay, so Cindy, if we can get that mic down. Thank you. Let's Thank them you. working together. What I would like to see is not only diversity of residents, but diversity of jobs in this community. Because if we don't have that, if we're all just techies, that's kind of boring. Is that controversial? Everyone want to be a techie? We're the cowboy bars. <laughs> so, so if we have a diversity of jobs, Theoretically, there would be a diversity of housing as well. And for housing, as well as transportation, we have to have funding. It's fine for everyone to sit around and talk about what we need to do and how it would be nice and everything, but how do we get the funding for this? How about, here's a little plug, development, new development, paying for the impacts it causes in the community. I've lived here long enough that I can see these things happening and have seen them happen. I've been on the city council. I was there when we had our first ad hoc transportation committee, chaired it even. I put in bike lanes. I mean, I brought forward the plan for the greenways, the tributary trails, so we'd have off-mode safe transit as well as recreational. Those were things that were actually accomplished. There was funding. We need funding. Where is it going to come from? We keep talking about all we need is more money. Where is it coming from? I'd like some specifics. So I wouldn't brag okay. about putting in more bike lanes. They're no longer popular in Boulder. <laughs> oh, I, you're right. Excuse Sorry me. about so that. So Bill Riggler. Uh, I, think, I think the single most important thing for city council to do is not to micromanage, but rather to kind of serve as a board of directors where we lay out the strategic vision and we let the market forces do their work. Um, we know nationally that we've seen cycles of recessions bubbles bursting, and the single best thing that we can do is make sure that we have a strong enabling environment, but also that we have an opportunity for businesses to come here, to grow, to thrive, and to succeed. And one point that Jan made that I'm absolutely on board with, and this is why I absolutely do not support 300 or 301, is that if we're not in a position to allow our businesses to expand, we're gonna lose them and we're gonna lose jobs. And that is the underpinning of our basic economy. 
So let me do a little follow up that because that's a great lead into what we're also doing tonight. Why, whether you support it or not, and we could have Cindy speak to this or others, um, well, still with Bill, why is 30301 so important, whether it's yes or no, for the future of Boulder? Almost more important than this entire, the rest of the election. Yeah. The basis of our democracy is majority rule, minority rights. If we pass 300, we flip that, where 10% of the population can have overwhelming veto authority over growth and development and plans for how our economy and city grows. That's not true. That's not true. So, so, okay. this isn't the daily camera forum. <laughs> Mariah, Mariah, do we need to pause and take a deep breath? Yes. No, no, I just, I think we need to relearn, hard. we need to relearn yeah. to have civil disagreement, yeah. respectful, and I love someone, minority <laughs> rights in America, who will speak against popular opinion. We're going to hear from both sides, and that's a natural lead into two very informed people. We're going to have a, what are those shows, like a point or counterpoint or whatever? Yeah, counterpoint the ones that John Stewart hated. But first, maybe Cindy could also speak, because you're a yes, right? Uh, are you a yes? We want a yes to speak I on this one. I am a yes on 300 and 301. Yes. So I can, definitely so am. So Cindy, real quick. So can you speak to why this is so important, almost more important than the rest of everything? If new development pays for its impacts, we have 60,000 in commuters plus a day coming into Boulder during the week, work week. So these jobs are not in Boulder that we're allowing to expand here and we're dealing with the impacts. If we spread the wealth a little, had some of those jobs spread out into the outer county, into the region, rather than having them come here and growing here in Boulder, we wouldn't be feeling so constrained. The new development paying its own way means that it helps to offset the services that we need here, such as transportation and affordable housing. And the neighborhood's right to so vote. So we're going to get into the specific which, issues. And I won't go any further in. Why is it so overwhelmingly important for the future of Boulder? It's money, money, money. That's why. It's the way to raise the money to help offset some of the impacts that we're dealing with now in terms of not having affordable, permanently affordable housing that the city can have, not being able to put an underlay underneath the mobile home parks that's permanent and give people some housing security. Um, same with transportation. We say how nice, it, how, is, how are we gonna pay for these eco passes? Is it out of your pocket or out of mine? You know, whose pocket should this be coming out of? It, it, it's a question of fairness somewhere as well. I'll say yours. So, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> and um, to that, let me say, ask one thing. Leonard has this great, um, Privatizing, um, privatizing wealth and, uh, no, Leonard, what is that, how does that go? Right, that line, yeah, I've heard it. That great line um, that's... Privatizing the profits and socializing the... Uh, the costs. Okay, so, so I'm genuinely undecided about this. I was raised by a hippie Buddhist who couldn't afford to stay here. Um, at the same time, a lot of uh, smart people I respect and have respected for a long time are on the no side. So just to tell you where I'm at, I'm happy to have both yard signs out. I've been in photos with both on both Facebook pages. Um, so I'm genuinely, so what we're gonna do, and we're gonna come back to Sue Prant and other questions. Um, we're gonna come back because I wanna get this in as a commercial break so people don't lo lose the 300, 301. Because the only thing I get about this is that it's probably going to change Boulder um, fundamentally over the next five, ten years or whatever, um, and decide whether people like myself who like, you know, the values that most of us share here, environmentalism, accessibility, whatever else, um, there's a long list, um, whether we'll want to stay here or if this will become, you know, a yuppie town or, or whatever. So, representing yes, we need some music. Representing yes, we got Mike Marsh. Um, so you can stay right there. And then representing no, we have Will Tour, who is long, is the only time I've seen him show up to a meeting without a bike helmet. Is this my, is this my shoe? Get his bike helmet. He can't talk without it. It's his totem. Um, so uh, we're going to, Can I know people can't really see. Should we get Will over here and Mike here? Can people see Mike? I can switch with Mike. Okay, do you mind switching with Will, actually? And then, and then we're going to come back. We have two more vital questions from Sue on... Um, something. 
So let's sit down. Hey, this is, guys, let's just grab a chair. So okay. Cindy, do you mind sitting there? No transition. So can you grab that possibly and put it right here? Okay, Mike. Good. Do you have anything? <laughs> okay. No talking, no community, no fun. So I want to get this done quickly so we can meet Bob at Mountain Sun. Guys, so I'm going to encourage people to wave your hands as ecstatically and as crazy as you want if you support someone. Mike, if you can face Will a little more. I know you two have been, I know you two have been disagreeing. Things have been hard. Can you face Mike a little more? So I'm right in the middle. So I'm the undecided voter. I'm the undecided voter. I care about Boulder. I care about Boulder's values. I like Will a lot. I kind of think he's siding with the Brad Felds of the world. Mike, I'm in inclined to be a yes, um, but I'm so curious why you're a no. So let's start with you. Oh yeah, Mike. So you know, I've lived in Boulder for 35 years. And my original experience of living in Boulder was being an 18-year-old who was living in Martin Acres with six friends, living in fear of our neighbors turning us in. And that, that really gave me a sense of what it was like to be in Boulder as somebody who doesn't have a lot of money, who's trying to get by in the community. When I look at 300 and 301, I think that they are the most fundamental change that will shut the door in Boulder to people who do not already own a home. And why, why is that? So I think they'll do several things. 301, you know, the proponents often like to talk about job growth. 301 applies to housing in addition to commercial development. It is completely undefined. There is nowhere in 301 that it says what are the additional costs that will be charged to new housing so let development me, in Boulder? Let me pause, if that's OK. Because I've talked with both sides, and it honestly sounds like different ballots whenever I hear it discussed. <laughs> so is that true? Is it undefined? Uh, Mike. Well, I'll, I'll just address what Will said first. It, it does not apply to housing. There's a clause in there that says that it, with regard to uh, it won't affect anything that home builders or homeowners are currently allowed to do within, uh, within the zoning regulations. If you're adding on to your house and it doesn't add additional dwelling units, it doesn't affect that at all. What it's about is more people add more impact to the city. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just having a mechanism to pay for that. That's what this is fundamentally about. So one criticism I hear a lot is that this is like the homeowners, the NIMBYers or whatever, the not in my backyarders, trying to keep you know good old Boulder and keep change away. And it's not practical. We're going to get sued into oblivion if we do this and shut down the economy. Well, other than that, it's great, though. Well, <laughs> first of all, the, the city attorney looked at, at both initiatives, and he didn't raise the question of lawsuits on it. Uh, that's, that wasn't his analysis. He so probably figured it was obvious. Uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and it's, it's not really a, a matter of taking a position pro or against, you know, growth or densification or zoning changes. Uh, and they are two different initiatives. So on the side of 300, it's just saying that the people who actually live in a neighborhood, who most understand the neighborhood, who understand the level of impacts that it can continue to absorb, get to have a voice in that, rather, so than, rather than some city planner who's never set w foot in the neighborhood, who's never- Because neighbors, neighborhoods are different, right? Absolutely. And it's no secret that some of the biggest proponents for 300 are the people that live around the university. Mm -hmm. Gosgrove, East Aurora, Martin Acres, and University Hill. It's, it's a whole other world there. I live in Martin Acres, and I have good friends that live in other parts of the city, and it's, it's nowhere like the level of impact I existing currently in those neighborhoods. So, so that, what about Bill's comment about the 10% thing? Is that accurate? Uh, no, it's not. It's, uh, the 10% comes from Colorado constitutional law that says to trigger a referendum, you can actually not require any more than 10% of, of an electorate to get something on the ballot. So it would be illegal to, to require any more than that. So what 10% does, to be clear, it triggers a vote of all the registered voters in the neighborhood. 
It's, it, it's the same petitioning process that got the open space charter amendment. 10% of Boulderites signed a petition to get that on the ballot and then everyone got to vote on it. It works the same way in the neighborhood. It would take a majority of the neighborhood to decide one way or another. So, so that, that's the number you have to re remember. So many years ago, I was on the board of the Boulder Co-op, one of the brilliant business plans here in Boulder. N you know, it's a joke. <laughs> no one remembers it. It went out of business, um, but we loved it. And I remember Will biking up with his helmet and opening it up. I think you've been a political idol of mine for many years. You're an environmentalist. Why on earth are you opposed to this? You know, if you look at the coalition of folks that is opposed to this, it is made up of environmentalists, affordable housing advocates. It's made up of the human services in the community and the business community. It's a very broad coalition because of what the impacts of this would be. If you look at it, again, from the housing perspective, if you look at the people who actually build affordable housing in this community, take a look at the editorial from Boulder Housing Partners. The f take a look at what the Tension Homes is saying. The people who do affordable housing think that this is going to make it much more difficult. And why from is that? How so, will make it difficult? Well, a couple of things. First, with 301, 301 does not exempt housing at all. We have no idea what new costs 301 will impose upon housing development. 300 will inject enormous uncertainty into projects of community significance, which often require ordinances or zoning changes in order to actually build the project. So Boulder Community Hospital, if 300 passes, we have no idea how it is going to play out in terms of whether the Boulder Community Hospital site will end up in a defined neighborhood. If so, which neighborhood it will end up in. It will likely require rezoning if we are going to get significant affordable housing in that site. That is, <laughs> you're throwing a major obstacle in the way of that by allowing a vote, or by allowing 10% of potentially a very small number of people to hold it until there is an election. You're adding more uncertainty into the process. The, uh, the other issue is from an environmental perspective. If we're serious about things like reducing our carbon footprint as a community, a big part of that is building a denser urban fabric in especially the eastern part of our community. Think of 28th Street, think of 30th Street. The type of development that, that we're doing around the transit station at 30th and Pearl, over time that is going to, to dramatically reduce the per capita amount of driving. People are going to be living in smaller units that have less energy consumption. Any, if but, we're serious yeah. about our carbon footprint, you can't get there while saying, no, we actually want development to happen out in the sprawling communities and other places in Colorado. We have to say, how can we do development here that will actually lead to less driving, less energy consumption, and more of an ability for people who go to school or work in Boulder to actually live near where they work and go to school? So, huh. is Steve still here? Fenberg? Yeah. So, <laughs> Steve? <laughs> Just one second, and you'll get plenty of time. So Steve and I agree on everything because I ask him for what my opinion is frequently. <laughs> <laughs> so I think Steve and I have both been a little bit uh, confused. We hear from good people we uh, respect on both sides. Steve, do you have a question? Do you feel like something's vague here? Like, if you're deciding right now, what do you want to ask What's these two? What's the neighborhood? What's the neighborhood? Uh, what's the neighborhood? What's the neighborhood? Um, to me. I'm so I'm, ask, well, I'm asking. So, so I'm asking Steve. I guess um, one question I have is is more specificity around what um, what what would be eligible to to sort of be have the ten percent of a neighborhood put something on the ballot. Um, I know it's you know I've sort of read that it's everything, any sort of development whatsoever, to you know just major changes in zoning, to occupancy limit changes, things like that. So what what are what do we know about you know the things that could happen in a neighborhood that would el be eligible to be sort of you know open back up via ballot from the neighborhood? So Mike, would you like to start on that? Sure. You need the mic, Mike. <laughs> um, and you can open that window if you're hot. Uh, there's a wooden dowel there. We need the dowel, or the, it'll crash and cut off your. So, Mike, that, that's a great question, Steve, and uh, th thanks for asking that. So. 
the entire point of the initiative is for entire rezonings of neighborhoods like wholesale widespread rezonings of entire residential neighborhoods it, it's not about projects individual projects and the city attorney's office uh, independent analysis confirmed that they came right out and said it's this does not pertain to individual projects okay so it's like if you live in a neighborhood and it's got a certain zoning and the city comes forward with a pr proposal to quadruple the density of the zoning what this says is you and all the registered voters who live in that neighborhood would be able to vote on that. And to Will's point about, you know, community-wide benefits, I, I live in Martin Acres again, and we just welcomed the Bridge House uh, transitional housing for formerly homeless individuals. We, first of all, we welcomed it. It's, it's a great program. But the point is we would never have been able to vote on that in the first place because it didn't apply. It, it, it's in an adjacent zoning. It, uh, you know, the city wasn't doing anything that's not uh, permitted under the current zoning. So what it is t specifically is there are zoning laws for every residential zoning in, in the city, and they do govern things such as height, how high you can build, occupancy limits, allowable uses, things like that, and this would apply if the city tries to change that. Like, you know, it's, it's not about individual projects, um, and I, I think this sets up a lot of false dichotomies. The, the, you know, is this I, beginning uh, to answer your question? We're going to go to Will, but is this beginning to address yeah. it? Yeah, so, so uh, a change in occupancy limits would fall under this category, right? So a change of occupancy like limits would fall under this category, right? Sure. And, in certain well, neighborhoods, you can have four people instead of three. Mm -hmm. Then that would be eligible for 10% of the neighborhood. Well, anything that's a zoning change, yeah. building a bit. So that's considered a Sure. At, as as is as is building above 55 feet that's the current height limit in boulder so if there's a proposal that they want to go into your neighborhood and say now someone can build up to 75 feet that's a land use regulation change that would be subject to the vote but 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 only but only in so far as your neighborhood you're not voting on anyone else you're not imposing your will 10 percent is not doing anything except getting it on a ballot for all of the people who live there Following this, we're going to take Will and Mike out back and settle it. <laughs> so, Mike and I actually met 35 years ago when he was driving the EcoCycle bus, and I was a kid who was loading and unloading hmm. newspapers off of it. So we're friends. We just disagree on this one. So, you know, just a, a couple of things. You know, City Council can't change the height limit above 55 feet because that's in our charter. That would actually require a vote of the entire community to do that. But, you know, I basically agree with much of what Mike just said, but a few qualifications. So it applies to any changes to occupancy. If the City Council passes a law to make it easier to do housing co-ops, that would be subject to the 10%. If the city tries to make it easier for people to do accessory dwelling units and granny units or tiny homes, the 10% would apply to that. And it does apply to- So you're to saying if you love tiny homes, vote no. Correct. All right. And if you like co-ops, <laughs> vote no. A added, to, added to that, it will, it, will affect, it will affect some individual projects. So in my neighborhood right now, there are two projects, potential projects. Again, one is a community hospital. The other is the old people's clinic site, which almost certainly will require a rezoning if there's gonna be housing on that site. Again, that's something that would, uh, would be subject to neighborhood vote. Then, you, if you... Only the zoning oh, yeah, project. But the project will require the zoning, so it, it's sort of a distinction. It's kind of a distinction, I think, without a difference. And if you look at things that have been going on in the last couple of months, just a couple of examples, the council figured out a compromise to address the historic home on 12th Street. That would have been subject to call up by a 10% petition. And the vacation rental ordinance, if it had not already happened before, the, before this move forward, would be subject to the 10% call up. And then I would give an example from when I was on council. We spent several years struggling with the question of citing the, a homeless shelter in the city of Boulder. That required a zoning change, and it would not have happened if 300 had passed. So well, I, I'd like to respond to that because, Will, you're presuming to know what neighborhoods would vote. And I don't know that. And that's one of the fundamental differences between me and Will is that I think the best about my fellow 
person. I assume the best in human nature. I, I, you know, most of us in Boulder are social progressives. So you're like the Harry Potter. Com compassionate. And he's, Vol <laughs> and he's Voldemort. And, uh, we're, you know, we're, I lived through the homeless shelter site. That's what I did. We're, we're, yeah. com we're compassionate individuals in Boulder. I don't check my notions of you know, social progressivity and community-wide concerns. I don't check that at the door when I drive into my neighborhood. And that's why we welcome the Bridge House. I think it's a great project. But I want to address a couple other things Will said that, uh, for one thing, the, the, neighbor, uh, the uh, Development Shall Pay Its Own Way initiative is the only 100% funding mechanism for affordable housing in the city. Nothing else comes close to it. Why? Because it uniquely asks new development to 100% fund the affordable housing implications that it brings to the city. Okay, the city of San Diego did an affordable housing study and they found that in order for the city not to go into the red, they would have to charge d developers of new office buildings in San Diego $72 per square foot in order to not go into the red. Why? Because this, that new development is gonna bring workers to San Diego. If you don't want them commuting from Bakersfield, there's an argument for having them live in San Diego. They're not gonna be able to do it. So the first thing they do is they get in line for the city's affordable housing program, as happens here. The problem is in Boulder, we're only charging $9.50 a, a square foot in affordable housing rates so from new development. The actual costs to the city of Boulder are seven times that much. And this is my central point about development that shall pay its own way. The costs are the costs. You can't escape them, they're there. And when cities grow, it requires more infrastructure, it requires more parks, rec centers, libraries, affordable housing, emergency response services, and the costs are the cost. Costs. So one who's criticism, gonna, Mike, Who's gonna pay Mike, is the question. So this is helpful. So one criticism I keep hearing is that if this happens, nothing will be built in Boulder, period. <laughs> That, the economy will collapse. That, that's not true. Boulder will continue to grow. It's just that we'll actually have a funding mechanism for the, the things that new growth is costing the city. So to that exact question, Will, do you think this will have dire effects on our economy and building? And so it is so vague that we have no idea what it will do to our economy or to the city budget. The one thing that we know is that next year will be an enormous hit to the city budget because as the city attorney has said, because we would have to figure out how to implement it, he would suggest that most building permits be halted. This year we had about $9 million in revenue from cons construction use taxes in addition to $6 million in planning and, and development that pays fees. for firefighting and for it, everything, it, right? So yeah. the $9 million no. is, the nine, the $9 million does, that is incorrect. Yeah. It go, that is sales tax revenue that goes some of it into open space, some into transportation, some into the general fund. All of our sales taxes have a use tax component. So we do know that next year would be hit to the budget. Over the longer term, there's no way of knowing what it will do because this thing doesn't, doesn't allow you to figure out how much you would actually be charging either to residential development or to commercial development. The right way to have done this, if you believe that there should be a $70 a square foot tax on new development would be what you do with every other tax issue. Shall taxes be increased by X dollars a square foot to generate this much revenue for this purpose? But they're when, trying to tax the developers, right? Yeah, but we have, well, who do you think pay, pays? It's not paid for by the developers. It's paid for by the people who live or work in the, those buildings afterwards. The developers pass those fees right on. So. You know, I'm, I don't think anybody who looked at my political history would accuse me of being a friend of developers. <laughs> you know, that, that just ain't the history there. But I do, I certainly do care about the ability of people to have affordable places to live and work in the city of Boulder. But the people funding no, when you look at it, are Tebow, I don't Radfeld. So there, there is no doubt that the, the business community sees this as a major threat to the economy of Boulder. It, and I agree with them. If I were them, I'd be putting money into the campaign also. If you look at who's giving money, though, it ain't just them. There's a very broad coalition. We have over 220, I believe, at this point, contributions that have been made by Boulder residents. Most of them are under $100. 
the coalition, you know, if you look around this room, you see bicycle activists, you see clean energy folks, you see affordable housing folks who are wearing the 300 and 301 buttons, the no one 300 and 301 buttons. It's not because they love developers. They are certainly allied with the business community on this issue because we all see it as a threat to the environment, a threat to the economy of Boulder, and a threat to our ability to have an inclusive community that has housing for young people, for seniors, for people who work in the city You're of Boulder. You're saying it'll actually have the contrary effects of the intention, basically. I think it is well-intentioned, but I think it's a big mistake. So a lot of what I object to about what the op opponents have said is that they set up a lot of false dichotomies, like, w like what Will just did. There are people who are for the environment who uh, are, you know, I live in a net zero house that I designed and built, okay? And I ride my bike all over Boulder. It's, it's not like people are of one stripe or another. And one of the most concerning things that I'm seeing in the city right now, I got an email from someone who's a co-op activist a couple weeks ago, and she was explaining to me how co-op people are more in keeping with the city and how they have more of a right to be here. And we're this close away to displacing indigenous peoples, except that they're gonna be people who live in neighborhoods. And, and it's kind of like, well, do we really want to go down that road? What I'd prefer is that we all be able to get along and that one of the best ways to do that is to ask the people who live in the neighborhood. But the, the other thing I'll say about Will saying that, uh, that, that the city attorney says this would stop projects, Keep in mind there's 20 to 30 projects already in the pipeline that have been approved by planning board. There is going to be building all over Boulder for the next five years, regardless of what happens. I feel like this conversation is stressing out Redford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When and we ate a piece of cake, I and <laughs> It was for Pascal. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why Sorry, he's stressed out. Ask right. first. He's and, first. And the last thing I want to say is that, you know, this has been in the comp plan for 45 years. There's been section 1.30 of the, of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan says, de it's actually titled, development shall pay its own way. And in that time, not a single one of the 16 councils since then has gotten this done. So there is a time when citizens are out ahead of their government, citizens initiatives have done wonderful things in the course of American history. This is a time when the citizens are saying, we need to get this done because development costs, remember too, they're not linear. It looks more like a hockey stick. All the transportation costs as the system starts to get maxed out, it costs more and more and more to mitigate the cost of traffic. Um, in terms of affordable housing, as the system gets more and more strained, these costs are, are uh, more closer to an exponential type of thing. So this is a question of citizens saying, the, citi the city's not getting it done we need to take care of this problem. And we've put forth something here that's very reasonable. It's much easier to be a naysayer and to take pot shots at everyone's idea. It reminds me when I was in, in school and we'd have group projects. I'd be one of the guys that would say, well, we could do this, we could do this. And it's yeah. far easier to be one of the people sitting back and say, no, that's a dumb idea. You know. So we're well over time. <laughs> um, but I, I think all of us could hopefully uh, applaud both of these gentlemen for <laughs> for doing something that I saw very little evidence of around the whole right-sizing uh, debate, which is uh, agreeing to disagree and being agreeable about it. Um, hopefully we'll learn something from it. I personally learned almost nothing from it. I'm <laughs> totally confused. Um, and, and All right, Mariah, why don't you just run this one? Okay. <laughs> All right, um, if, you, uh, if you are pro, yes on 300, can we see your hands, please? Yes. Okay, so we've got Leonard, Ed, Jatsna, and Cindy, yes on 300. Who is yes on 301? Same folks. Same folks, okay, very good. And so who is no on 300? Everybody else? And every, and every, the same on the 3, 301. Okay, very good, thank you. Cool. <laughs> if you can't count, I don't know if I'm going to vote. Okay. I won't say it. So final question, and I want to thank Sue Prant particularly for waiting, but I was afraid that if we um, did all the questions all at once, everyone would leave and miss this incredibly important issue, 300, 301. So Sue Prant has a question for everyone. Thanks. Or for whomever. 
Um, okay, so sort of somewhat similar. So uh, I guess I have to a little bit disagree with Mike that the best intentions of people seem to be happening in Boulder because having just been part of something where I did not see the best intentions of people in protecting the light ri rights and lives of bicyclists and, and uh, keeping their safety. Um, and I guess it also uh, goes to council leadership. So there are some things that we all sit at these forums and people all say to me, oh, I love bikes, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I love co-ops. People should be able to live together. Yet when we tried to bring senior co-ops, senior co-ops for seniors to council, it failed miserably because people, what I would term as people then, you know, somewhat not in my backyard, people spoke out, I don't want those co-ops near me. So it failed. When we tried to bring a uh, experiment through to town that would pr create more safe spaces for bicyclists to ride, that failed because people yelled and screamed, the daily camera encouraged them, and then council caved to that. So how are we gonna have leadership from council that will actually put forward these ideals we talk about, all these great things we talk about, and sometimes that's unpopular. But how are we going to have that leadership and not just tell me that here and tell me that in other places, but then when it actually happens, and tell the rest of our citizens, not just me because it's bikes, tell the rest of our citizens, how are we actually going to stand by those values and basically not bullshit us? I think Zan hit the bug there first. Well, let me just at least speak to the council leadership thing. Right now, what we hear from a lot of people is we don't feel heard. And which I think is really hard for council to hear because, God, we're having a lot of meetings where we hear from a lot of people. <laughs> um, but part of it is this community is divided. And so to hear one part and not hear the other puts us in a really tough position. So I just want to say that that is the crux. Uh, to me, that's the crux of... Um, serving on council is how do you do what you think is right and also be open to input from people that disagree because this is a representative democracy. So I just throw that out there is the big challenge. And right-sizing, we hit a nerve like I can't believe we did. <laughs> um, and I also want to say that if we had done a perfect process and gotten all the data right, I would have felt better to just plow ahead. But we could have done a better job. We have learned some good lessons. Uh, the next time we do buffered bike lanes and if I'm on council, we're going to do more bu buffered bike lanes. Mm -hmm. uh, we will do it better. Um, and I think try to engage people more in the where do you want to put the north-south connections? What does it need to look like? Um, so that when we finally do it, people can't say, well, well wait a minute, we just found out about it. So I think that's, that's part of it. Um, but I also want to say that we do have a transportation master plan. We do have goals for climate, for transportation, and we need to meet them. Um, so we will come back and try again in a different way, in a more inclusive way. Um, this isn't over, but we do have to also proceed in a way that doesn't totally polarize our community more than it already is. So, so, so there. Follow-up question. Why yep. wasn't there a path forward for the existing council members, question for you all, to improve right-sizing instead of getting rid of it? Okay, well, wait a minute. W all we did was scale back on the two, and I know it's a big scale back, but it is, <laughs> Those two blocks in the middle, we have it on either end, including right. dressing some major safety So you feel things. like you are improving it, not getting rid of it. Right. I, I wish we could go further, but w I don't want to do it in a way that forever after buffered bike lane means war. Mm -hmm. So I think that was kind of where we're at. But we did not right. get rid of it by any stretch of the So record. next, I got to go to Bill here, a new man. Uh, last week we discovered water on Mars. And we discovered water on Mars because 60 years ago, John F. Kennedy challenged us to go to the moon. And it took us 11 Apollo missions to get to the moon. Uh, as a society and as a culture, we learn by doing. There's a Buddhist teacher named Pema Chodron who's got a great quote called fail, fail again, fail better. The entire basis of Boulder's economy is on innovation, and the way that we innovate is by doing short pilot projects where we can learn from that, use, that we use to guide policy. The, the protected bike lanes on Folsom was a one and a half mile strip that resulted in 70% increased bike ridership, 20% reduction in cars, and reduced the speed limit by five miles, uh, or nearly five miles, so that's an element of safety. 
Um, I absolutely supported the protected bike lanes as a, member of the as a member of the transportation board. But what I can tell you is that I will never again support a pilot project that does not have clear metrics in place for success, measurement, timeline, and public information and outreach. And to Zan's point, this was a huge teaching moment for the city. And it would be a shame for us to take that teaching moment and throw it to the dustbin. We should learn from it, we should improve, and on council, that's exactly what I'll do. Thank you. Aaron? Or Aaron and then on the end. Yeah, I think I think leadership is is crucial. You know, so uh, for me personally, in, in my campaign, I've been clear about where I stand in terms of housing issues. You know, allowing uh, building more 15-minute neighborhoods, allowing uh, for more co-ops for more people to live together, promoting alternative transportation, doing new bike infrastructure. You know, working on renewable energy and. You know, I, f I also feel like we need to listen to everyone, so I intend to collaborate with the community on how we accomplish these goals. So but for me personally, I will... Just specific, Aaron, I'm sorry, yeah. maybe you're about to get specific, sure. but everyone yeah. could have said this. So co-op, co you know, more co-ops, okay. changing the occupancy limits. How would you, know. you improve the right-sizing problem? And, the, well, we I think people have already said good things about you need a more collaborative process ahead of time. So that was where it's like, you bring the community together on how to accomplish that, but you say, okay, we need better north-south bike routes. So let's come together and figure out how we make that happen. And then you show the leadership to, to move it forward and, and stick with it. You do it with the data. Bill said great things about that. But I think the, the key piece is, is you, you, you work with people who state clearly what they want to accomplish and then look for the leadership from them to push that forward and make that happen. On so council. we said we'd end at 7. That's pretty ambitious. It's 7.07. Do we have time for two more people to answer? And then we'll endorse and we can hang out and party or leave. Um, so uh, I think we had Tim had his hand up. Okay. No, Lisa. <laughs> yeah. um, Tim, here you go. So first I would say something generally about um, leadership. And I think that that's when you, when you try to get on council, you come from a place. Maybe you're from the business community or maybe you're from the plan boulder side. But when you sit on council, you see the entire community. And I think that you bring your values to that, but that sitting in that seat shapes you as well. Mm -hmm. And so you listen to everyone and you still s try to stay true to what you, know, what you think is right for the community. Uh, with regard to, to right sizing, I, I see it as a, an opportunity that was lost for us. And I think we needed to do better on the front end of that. That's my disappointment in terms of better outreach to the businesses, um, better outreach to, um, to uh, the public, and a better expectation of what we thought we wanted as an outcome. And just as a comparison, okay, it was really that. interesting to me, the same night that we looked at the right sizing, um, we also passed a commercial energy conservation ordinance, which was huge in terms of e things that happened to commercial buildings in this city. And we did the outreach right on that. We had one person come and talk to us, one person. Yeah. And we passed it. And that's a big damn deal for our city right, making our buildings more efficient. Yeah. And so I think there's a lesson for us there in terms of our process. So we did, we did the commercial energy conservation ordinance, one person came and talked to us. I got a thousand emails or more about right sizing. And that says something to me about how but we- But it's how so we much easier to s just comment on Facebook and I mean, <laughs> democracy is so hard. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you, Tim. Sure. Bob. First of all, and most importantly, there's more pineapple down at the end of the table. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And all kidding aside, I think we actually need more pineapple in this community because more, because more organic, more organic pineapple. Because, because pineapple is the um, pineapple is the fruit of welcome, of hospitality, of sharing, and I think um, we go through the motions of sharing and communicating in this community. Um, you all been up there and you get a three minute supplicant uh, opportunity to talk to council. But I think these are the types of forums we need to have. These are the types of forums where we engage, we t sit across the table from each other, share a bottle of wine, something. sorry for those of you who didn't get any, um, share awesome. some pineapple, and have the opportunity to have an open dialogue. So I think study sessions should be open dialogues with the community. I think uh, council meetings need to be on Saturdays and Sundays occasionally. I think they need to be in the community, in churches, in schools, in community centers. We need to be talking to people, not giving them three minutes to, to say their piece and then moving on. And I think those genuine dialogues are what's going to cause us to make the types of decisions that Sue's talking about. Thank you. So city councilors need to party more, basically. You party more. <laughs> Lisa, you've been patient. Okay. And Keith. So maybe? I would say right sizing isn't over, that we're going to go forward. I think we made big mistakes in this particular issue. 
You know, we, um, our staff didn't give us an, uh, adequate information. They didn't anticipate what was going to happen on parallel streets off of Folsom. They didn't anticipate what was going to happen at the mid-block um, crossings. That was a significant thing. For us not to listen to that and try to repair that would be irresponsible. Well, and what I, do you have to, my, if I may, what do you have to say to Mary Young's point? She left. Um, she obviously doesn't care about this entire process, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, uh, to me the problem wasn't the problems, but the problem was the dialogue. It was so the problem dialogue. is the dialogue, and there needs to be a little bit more tolerance and discussion about who you are on the other side. It's not us versus them. We all are one com Well, and we community. could have improved it if we could have and discussed we, it. And we have done this before. I mean, yeah. we've done 16, uh, 17th Street, we've done 13th Street, we've done Table Mesa on East and West. I mean, look at North Broadway. That is a right side street. I got involved in that in 1992. You know, if you look at Linden, all of those things, they were incremental, but there was a process and it, it included everybody's voice. And I think we need to be inclusive. And so I think also, you know, um, I, I've spent a lot of time speaking with staff and when our staff tells us, you know what, Things have been so busy this year, and our staff has, has been so much in the advocacy position. We have got to quit being advocates. We've got to be, as staff, we've got to give counsel and our boards objective recommendations, and they have to be based on fact and data. And in this particular case, it just was not the case. So to those who might say, <coughs> Um, I'm going to give a tough one, but I like you. Um, that you basically uh, took right sizing out behind the barn and put it out of his misery. What would you say to that? I would say I didn't do that. I would yeah. say I. I would say that you know when you get 2,000 emails and a lot of people are commenting yeah. on that, you have to listen. And for me, as a daily bicyclist, as a daily person who commutes by bike, if you want to move bikes forward, you can't force it back onto the drivers. You've got to make everybody feel part of the discussion. And I think fundamentally we have to quit judging each other. I don't know what goes on in each one of your lives. I, I really don't. And I don't really want to know unless I can somehow help you. <laughs> but but I, 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 don't, I don't think, I, <laughs> I don't think, you know, um, it's, it's a very good thing to be judging other people. And that's kind of the fundamental failure of democracy is when we start saying I'm better than you and I know better than you, then we start failing and we start failing our, our people. And I think we have to do a much better job. So I think everyone would agree with that. 714, not too bad. So I want to thank all the candidates and Will and Mike. Angelique for showing up, give her a little shout out. The staff, videographers, and particularly you all for sweating through this. The only person I don't want to thank at all is whoever brought these red cups. If they'd read the Camp Elephant rules, there are no plastic to-go cups allowed in Camp Woo! Elephant. Yay. I can't believe that, Michelle. You're breaking my heart. We, we actually buy, so, so, you guys, we got to wrap this up. So we call it Walk the Talk Show. We try not to do this kind of thing. We actually bought China and stuff off Craigslist. We have none of this ever. Um, but, uh, so all the VIP question askers, if you can come back here. We're not going to we'll get very a, last, quickly, a last saying or anything. I, mean, I think we're well over out. time, but um, maybe before we. Oh, okay. So, so um, it would really help if everyone were quiet for 10 seconds and if the VIP question askers pause just very quickly, Ed, what can we do in two minutes that would make something meaningful? People are tired. You want to just offer well, something? I, I, I just wanted to, you know, I, I came, I thought we were going to discuss 300, 301 more as a candidates. Yeah. It took me a long time to get to a point to uh, make, make a decision where I stood on it. Everybody seems to want to vote. 
uh, or a lot of people, people seem to, to want to vote down. for candidates based on their position on that. And um, you I know, think, currently I, we've I got we've got time. just like the major development hey, can people forces. people either sit down and respect Ed, who's trying to talk, mm. or we have to say, Ed, sorry, we just have to end this. <laughs> can people sit down? Are you willing mm. to sit down, sir? You're really tall. Well, <laughs> thank right. you so much for giving me another minute. So. Um, Okay, here's, we've, a we've, here's a compromise. So why don't you all have final statements with everyone, and we'll go okay. back here. Great. We've currently got major development yeah, fo forces that are f focused and pushing agendas on Boulder. Yeah. Uh, some of those <laughs> proposals may yeah, end up being good, yeah. but really they're all based on the bottom line, financial bottom line, just one bottom line. We need to be looking at triple bottom line and the Boulder Valley Comp Plan. Everything that's in there, if you look at it, 90% of it gets ignored when we're looking at these projects. Now, to be worried that 10% or a small, to, to even think that there's 50% or more of uh, NIMBYs in any neighborhood that's gonna kill a project, I think that's kind of fear-mongering in my opinion. There's um, you know, democracy that's ready to happen with that. We've got a city council right now that doesn't seem to hear or represent the people and often fall in, falls into lockstep with each other and not doing thorough research. We can, we can fix that. Um, the city and the planning department has no real uh, oversight. Um, they have immunity from the mistakes they make. So this 300, 301 provides a real, um, a real safety net for major development coming in and changing neighborhoods. And we gotta keep that in mind. I, I have faith in the people as well. And I don't think that we're gonna get 50% of a neighborhood that's our NIMBYs, and if we do, then that's probably not the right project for the neighborhood. <laughs> well, I'll just make a closing statement. I've been on council for 16 years, and as a research geologist who studies volcanoes, I have taken the heat for the city of Boulder, and I will continue to take the heat. I have promoted good environment, I've promoted affordable housing, I've promoted safe streets, and I've prom promoted a clean environment, and moving forward so that we can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm asking for one more term, one more vote, and let me continue being your voice for Boulder. Uh, I decided to run for council simply because I was those people who went to city council meetings, planning board meetings, landmarks board meetings, and I would get up and say my three minute piece. And I was welcome to do that and it was recorded, but I don't think it had any kind of impact on the ultimate outcome. And this is what has bothered me about the way city council works, that the voice of the people is sort of heard, but it's never respected. If we say something, we should say it at the beginning of the process, rather than when the process is presented to us and we are asked to give feedback on it. Feedback is not enough. If we had had initial engagement before the right sizing, maybe it would have been much better. And people keep saying on council and in other places that yes, we have all this engagement, but half the time people in Boulder aren't even aware of what is being proposed. So I think we need to have a much better process of outreach to the people, having them come in before anything is discussed and planned so that the plan is developed with their say-so, not just to be presented to them and then they can say yes or no. And this is why I support these two uh, initiatives because I think it does give people a voice and it gives them certainty in their neighborhoods and certainty that the development that comes into their community will help enhance it and not degrade it. So my name is Tim Plass again, and thank you for sitting through all this. I really appreciate it, and uh, I'm, I'm up for re-election. Uh, first, I just say it is a privilege to represent the people of Boulder, and for the last four years, I've had the chance to do that, and we argue in this community uh, about things. We argue about right-sizing. We argue about uh, the ballot measures, but I am just so proud to be from here because we do so many great things. So I want to say that first. Um, second, with regard to process and what Joe just said, um, we have some people who tell us that we have too much process, and we have other people who tell us we don't have enough, right? And so um, that's a real challenge for us to find that right line, and we're trying, and it's a challenge um, to, to, find, to find that balance. Um, but i just briefly say three things that I would like to work on in my next term um, I want to find a way to make sure that we can have nurses and teachers and firefighters live in this community 
that's a, such a big deal to me. It's really the crux issue for us in terms of our economic vitality, in terms of transportation, in, times, in terms of environmental issues. Secondly, I, I want to continue to work uh, on us being great environmental stewards. And for me, that means finding a way to get green, clean energy. That's a big part of it. It also means continuing with our zero waste goals, which we've made some big strides on this, this term. A and finally, um, in my time in Boulder politics, which is oh, probably 12 or 15 years now, I started as a neighborhood activist. I don't think I've ever seen our community so divided. And I would really like to see us try to come together, especially around the areas of growth and development and, and neighborhood issues. And I'm not a proponent. I'm not supporting either 300 or 301. But I do think that we can do some area planning to try to give more certainty to neighborhoods about the type of development that goes in around them, the scale, what the uses will be, and come together, have that discussion, and put that in place. And that's what I'd like to do. So I hope you'll consider voting for me. And, and thank you so much again for being here tonight. Uh, I'm Bill Riggler. Um, I was born and raised in Montana. I now work as the Director of University Relations at Naropa University. Uh, I've received the two very highly coveted endorsements from Better Boulder and Open Boulder because of my laser-like focus on workforce housing, uh, growth and development, and transportation. Um, I moved to Boulder to work as the spokesman and head of communications for former Vice President Al Gore at his Global Climate Change Initiative. And then uh, before that, it spent a number of years in New York City at senior positions at the United Nations, at the Rockefeller Foundation, and at global health and development organizations. Um, crucially, I'm 40 years old, uh, and I rent. <laughs> and I think that as we talk about diversity of opinions and backgrounds and capabilities on council, it's really, really important, I think, to find and bring on to council those people who have your voice in mind, um, who know what it's like to not know whether or not you're going to be able to live and afford in Boulder, and to know what it's like to uh, be young and hungry. And um, I think a big part of that is, and the common theme that we've all heard is, uh, are you being listened to? And more importantly, what are you doing about it? Uh, I'd appreciate your vote. Thanks so much. Well, I'm the guy that brought the pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> so if you re remember, oh, gonna one, I'm going to play this as long as I can. <laughs> No, there's more pineapple down there, <laughs> Josna. Pass, pass the pineapple up to Josna. She wants some more pineapple. Hey, Rob, how do you know about local food? I love local food. I love local food. You know, pineapple doesn't grow really well in Colorado, though, unfortunately. So, but, but, but other than that, <laughs> I, I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna tout my, my biography. You can read all that on, on, uh, on the website when you, if you want to go to find it. But. Um, I, th I think we just need to bring people together and get stuff done. Um, you know, that's what I've done for the last 30 years, and that's what I think we need to do in this community. I agree with Tim that we're pretty divided right now, and that sucks. Um, and we need to have more dialogue. This is great. I li this is th th this is like council meeting should be like this, right? We should all be sitting around eating pineapple, drinking, yeah. uh, drinking beer and wine, <laughs> and I think we get more stuff. And I'm going to pass the baton to Cindy because she's going to tell, tell us how to do it. So thank you very much for, for coming tonight. And um, if anyone wants to grab um, more beer, um, over at, where are we going tonight? Is there a designated place? Sun. Mountain Sun? Mountain Sun. Mountain Sun. Mountain Sun afterwards. OK. OK, thanks, Blaine. <laughs> so I, I would just like to say that it's great to see so many young people here. And I know it's hard for you to believe, but some of us were once young, too. <laughs> And <laughs> <laughs> and when I moved here in 1968, I lived up on the hill in a house with way too many people renting at that time. But everyone got along. It was a pretty copacetic time in Boulder. I worked cleaning the bar in the sink upstairs. That was kind of gross. Mm -hmm. So, But I know what hungry is. And it, it doesn't come, I mean, you're not the only ones in that place. You're not the only ones who've been there. And so I hope you'd cut some of the old folks some slack and realize that we're em empathic too. I've got kids. You know, they can't live in Boulder, unfortunately, except maybe they could if we passed these group home regulations or if they lived with me. There we go. <laughs> so thank you. And thanks to Will um, for his argument. I don't agree with him at all on that, but we've agreed <laughs> on other things. 
Will and I worked together. Will was at the Environmental Center when I was a regent on the University of Colorado board, where I worked on such things as trying to green the university, a hard thing to do. Will did a great job when he was there, and, and it continued after he left, but he set the, laid the groundwork. Um, also diversity issues, which is also difficult. These are really difficult things in this community. It has been and always seems that it will be. I don't know what we do unless we actually wrestle people in from other, other communities, but um, welcoming is a big piece of that. And I'm ready to pass the baton. I believe strongly in public service and public engagement. And I would say that one of the reasons that Boulder is so awesome is because of this and this community and us figuring it out together. And I, I would just like to add that when these elections are over, we all gotta come together and figure it out. And I hope we don't create so many rifts in our community that we can't do that. And one of the ways we're gonna do that, I hope, is through the update of the um, Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. And I hope everybody will engage in that. There's gonna be some, uh, that's where I think we're gonna try to answer some of these important threshold questions <laughs> Um, I mean, we're at a crossroads, right? These aren't surprising. It's not surprising that we're here. We're a mature city facing growth, development, affordability issues, kind of like a lot of cities around our country and a lot of cities around up and down the front range. And they're important issues, they're tough issues, and they're exactly what we should be dealing with. So anyhow, I hope everyone will engage in the comp plan update and be a part of figuring this out together because I think that's how we'll do that. And on top of that, I just want to say, this is a great place to live, and there's a lot of really cool things happening in addition to this tough stuff. So thank you all for being a part of that. Leonard May and ditto. Um, uh, one thing that I, I hear a lot about is how divided the community is. Um, I have a fairly extensive background working in uh, democracy development in nascent democracies. And this is kind of the holy grail to have this level of engagement. So I don't actually look at this as um, dividing the community. I look at it as democracy at its best. Uh, you want this kind of robust uh, dialogue between people. What you don't want is everybody agreeing on everything. I guess, I guess I'm done. All right, so it was pretty easy. That's a joke. Um, so first of all, um, you know, obviously great candidates. One of the things that, is Boulder, that has made Boulder happiest, greenest, best place to retire, best educated, long list, um, and we have plenty of faults as well, but is the active citizens who are um, motivated to serve. Um, today I was up at YMCA and there was a Bible quote that said something about uh, greatness through service. So thank you to all of you. Um, you don't have to clap because here comes the bad news for most of you. <laughs> so so uh, we were unanimous in a couple that I'll start with. Zan Jones. I feel like I'm on Survivor. Or <laughs> we're on Survivor. Who was the second one we, uh, I, I probably have to do this. Uh, Aaron. Oh yeah, Aaron, newbie. Then we got into a big argument that took a while. <laughs> What's that? Shh, 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 don't give it away. Come on, drama. God, I'm a storyteller, Sue. Sue, I know. I know. You know that nervousness you felt? You had to fill the space? That's what drama is made of. Tim Plass. Tim Plass. And if you disagree with our endorsements, God bless, because, you know, we're a diverse community. Or, you know, in our views, if nothing else. <laughs> So then we got into another long argument, and um, some very kind things were said about Bob, though we disagree <laughs> with him on many things. We love, everyone in the um, question askers, community leaders group, loved, loved working with you, saw, saw you accomplish a lot, a lot with the nonprofit, nonprofit community, community, et cetera. Et cetera. Bob, Bob Yates. Yates. And then we got, we got into, into a long argument. argument. The, the argument got longer as it got uh, down, down to it. it. Uh, there, there were some, some very, very strong, strong votes for Lisa, Lisa Morzell. You, you can clap. clap. <laughs> there, there are voices for Jokesna. Mm -hmm. 
and there were some belligerent voices for Bill Riggler. <laughs> <laughs> we finally decided, in keeping with a community that loves to disagree, hopefully agreeably, that we would, um, if you want experience, someone ready to hit the ground running, Lisa Morzell. Yeah. And if you want someone brand new who happens to be a renter, <laughs> On 300-301, things started getting physical, <laughs> and we overwhelmingly were no. So, we're not here to tell you how to vote. We are here to have a community process. Hopefully we've accomplished that, had a little bit of fun, a lot of pineapple, some carrots, and thank you so much for coming. Please stop by at any time, Elephant HQ. This endorsement, uh, including school board, will be in a video form uh, tomorrow, hopefully. And if everyone would like to share this, if you're violently disappointed, I don't expect you to share it. Thank you so much.